Taylor McCarg joins us now, college football analyst, and uh, I'm I'm sure are you are you into your Texas Tech stuff yet? Have you gotten into that yet? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah I was doing a deep dive on uh, you know my backup when I was at Rice um, actually played for Joey McGuire when he was at Cedar Hill, so I was going way back into the Joey McGuire high school days, and then uh, his moved to Baylor and then staying on and all of that. So I was, I was doing a deep dive last night on that. Okay. Well, look, I, I, he is, uh, I can't wait for you to meet Joe McGuire if you haven't yet. Uh, he's, uh, he, he is an enthusiastic individual that I, I, I will tell you, I, I've never met anybody quite like him. Uh, I've never yeah. met anybody that fired up about everything. Yeah, I have not yet, but I love, I think I said this to you guys the other day, to me, outside of Lincoln Riley, he was my favorite hire of the entire offseason because I think he gets Texas Tech, and that's a perfect cultural culture fit where he's going to energize the fan base and he's going to be able to walk into any high school in the country for, or sorry, any high school in the state for recruiting and resonate with these coaches. And I thought that was what was missing with Wells when they let him go. I know that was it was an odd season where they had a winning record when he was fired. Um, but looking forward to getting up there and, and calling that game. And again, I think he was, that, that's a huge win for the Red Raiders. Yeah. All right. Lots of quarterback battles uh, being decided. Some still up in the air, uh, you know, at least as far as we've been told uh, from the coaches, you know, around as, as media. But uh, the, the big one today, there was a little bit of scuttlebutt on the internet that Hudson Card might have won the Texas job. That did not happen. It is Quinn Ewers, like most people expected. But, uh, is there a quarterback that maybe has loftier expectations on him than te- than Quinn Ewers at Texas does this year? No, I don't think so. Uh, really, the only other person I would say that might, who's not even in college yet, is the heir apparent in Arch Manning. Um, but, you know, such is life as being the quarterback at University of Texas. To me, this made a lot of sense because he's your five-star. He's You're trying to energize the fan base going into week one against the team that it doesn't matter who they put a quarterback, they're going to roll against ULM. Uh, and I think for Longhorn fans, they, you're really just building up to week four. You're trying to get through your out-of-conference schedule. You're, you're very unlikely you're beating Alabama, regardless of who's at quarterback. But you should be 2-1 and one through the non-conference. And by the time you get to Big 12 play, you want to have your guy figured out. And so Quinn and Hudson Carter are going to play against ULM. doesn't matter. And then uh, hopefully against Alabama, if you're Texas, one of them is you know, if it's Quinn, that's your guy, and hopefully you're playing well. But I would imagine you see both of them in that game as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if you see both against UTSA. Um, but the, the whole purpose of this is to make sure you have a solid starter before you get into Big 12 play and then move forward from there. Do you, how much is does the layoff between the last time you've played, which for Quinn Ewers is two years ago, uh, and – in the game he'll play against ULM, how much does that worry coaches? And, and how real is it that your first game action back, you can be super rusty? Well, it matters tremendously. And the biggest thing that I, I don't I think people gloss over at the quarterback position, regardless of how long it's been, but your entire offseason and through spring ball and practice and camp, they don't get hit. And so there is an adjustment, regardless of how much time it's been. Forget, you know, for Quinn, it's been since 2019. And also, that was high school kids hitting him. And I know ULM is not Alabama, but those are still Division One athletes on that other side. And he's going to there. There's going to be some collisions early on that I think you know. Hopefully, that settles you down as a quarterback, where you get hit and you find a rhythm and you go from there. But it's been a long time since he's faced live action, and the live action he did face looks a lot different than Division One football, especially at the level that Texas competes at. So uh, there's going to be some rust. I think Longhorn fans. Again, I think the over-under win total for them this year is eight, eight and a half games. So a step in the right direction would be to get to eight wins. I think that's a, a positive step forward. I know there's lofty expectations in Austin. I live in Austin. I, I hear about them all the time. But the recruiting classes that Stark has from last year and this year and what they're putting together for next year, the pieces are coming. They're building towards something in Austin, but it's not going to happen this year. Uh, again, we talked about this last week. I think their ceiling is 10 wins, and they might be a, a Big 12 championship game type of team. But I think it's more realistic that they have two or three losses in conference, and this is more like an eight-win team. 
Now, Casey Thompson, another, he's a former Texas quarterback. He's now uh, gone to Nebraska, which uh, if I was trying to make my dad, who was a star at Oklahoma, Matt, I would go play for his two biggest rivals <laughs> in my life. Uh, but he's at Nebraska now with Scott Frost. Uh, a lot of pressure on Scott Frost, not necessarily on Casey Thompson, but look, I, Scott Frost has to win this year to keep that job, and Casey Thompson is trying to revive a very proud program that has had a long, long, long drought from being proud about anything. Uh, what do you think about Casey Thompson and the fit with Scott Frost and Mark Whipple, the offensive coordinator there? Yeah, the, the 2021 Nebraska Cornhuskers are the greatest 3-9 and nine team of all time. <laughs> uh, I think all of their losses were, I think, inside of nine points or inside of eight points, and gave a bunch of games away late, but really was not a bad football team. I mean, statistically, a pretty solid Big Ten football team. They just could not put teams away. Uh, for Casey Thompson, for Cornhuskers fans, this is an upgrade from Adrian Martinez, and that's what you're looking for. Uh, I think Casey Thompson is limited in some of the things he can do. He doesn't have a, a super strong arm, doesn't drive the ball real well, but he's played a lot of football. And to me, again, this is an upgrade from Adrian Martinez. And similar to what we were just talking about with Texas, you just need some positive momentum under Scott Frost. And I think you're going to get that. This should be, at a minimum, a bowl team again. I wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me if Nebraska is back to a, a seven or eight win team this year. Uh, now, on Adrian Martinez, I, I agree with you that I think Casey Thompson is an upgrade for Scott Frost. But I do think Adrian Martinez is an upgrade in Kansas State for Chris, for Chris Kleiman because. I think that the marriage between Nebraska and Adrian Martinez just kind of had to end. They, they had gone as far as they could together, and they couldn't work out a system where Adrian go save us wasn't the, the MO. And I think that some of the things that he does poorly, that Kansas State will maybe, for lack of a better term, beat out of him. Yeah, you make a good point, and sometimes you just need a refresh. I think Spencer Rattler is another good example of that. What does he look like in South Carolina? A lot of the reports, and I know it's camp. I know everybody says the right thing. But I was around him at the Manning camp this summer, and I was impressed by him. I thought he showed himself well. He introduced himself to everybody. He was very polite. Now, that can change on a dime if things start going poorly. But sometimes you just need a refresh. And I think Adrian Martinez is a great example of that, where he felt all the pressure in the world in Lincoln, and you saw those the turnovers. I mean, he had a touchdown to interception ratio was terrible for them. It was close to one to one. And that some of those. I remember them opening against Illinois last year with a really terrible interception early in that game. It was those kind of mistakes that got him behind the eight ball and just never felt like he could move on. So you're right. I think you know, moving over to Manhattan, Kansas, hopefully this is a refresh for him and uh, they get back going in the right direction. All right. So now there are some out there that have not been determined. And for some teams that have lofty expectations, one, uh, Texas A&M is ranked sixth, seventh, eighth. You know, depending on, on where you look, there are a lot of expectations for the Saggy team because of what they built around the quarterback. But Haynes King, Max Johnson, Connor Wiegman, we don't know. We don't know who it's going to be yet. And Jimbo Fisher will hold that in until he absolutely has to say it. He's done it his whole uh, career, you know, it's always a competition, but who do you think it's going to be in college station? I think it's probably Haynes King and similar to what we were just talking about uh, in Nebraska, both of these players, are, these are going to be upgrades to Zach Calzada, which is a good thing if you're a Texas A&M fan, because, you know, talk about recruiting classes, A&M's got the horses. I mean, they've got the pieces in place right now to challenge for the SEC West. Alabama is still the best team in the West. But A&M is the second best team, and we, as we've seen in the past, they it, it's not beyond them to upset Bama. Um, to me, Haynes King is has the greater upside. The mobility is there. He's a phenomenal athlete. But don't be surprised also if you see Max Johnson out of the gate win this battle because he played a lot of football and did some nice things for LSU last year. As the season goes along, though, similar like we were talking about with Texas, I think you're going to see both of these guys early in the season. And by the time you get to SEC play, hopefully you've, you've found or gotten in a rhythm with one of these two, but both good options for the Aggies. Yeah, with, with A&M, uh, the other thing they need to do is, look, if you beat Alabama, yes, but you cannot lose to Mississippi State and LSU. You, you can't do that. Like, you, you've got to beat the teams you're supposed to beat because those teams are teams you shouldn't have lost to last year. You're exactly right. And that's been the, the thorn in the side of A&M since they moved over to the SEC is they'll have a, a upset 
a LSU or an Alabama, but then they drop games in conference that they just shouldn't lose to. Out of conference for them this year, very manageable. And so I think assuming they get to Arkansas, their their opener in the SEC play, which is played in Jerry World, you're hoping that you're 4-0 and by that point of the stretch. And then they hit that three in a row, really tough middle of the season stretch where they go to Mississippi State, they play at Bama, and then they play at South Carolina. If they get through that stretch, ideally, maybe with just one loss the end of Bama, still in a really good position to have a great season. But the talent is there. You're exactly right. They've got to get over the hump and win the games that they're favored in, which they've slipped up time and time again since they moved over to the SEC. All right, Texas Tech uh, still don't know that that quarterback, and that's that's something that we talked about early in, in the – in the segment here, you're, you, that's your first game that you were going to broadcast. Uh, who is who? Do you think is the best shot there? I think it's Tyler Shuck, uh, quarterback that transferred from Oregon. He he led Oregon to the Fiesta Bowl in the 2020 shortened season, and really was playing pretty good football early in the year last year and broke his collarbone against Texas. Donovan Smith comes in. They've got Baron Morton that's highly recruited behind him as well. I just think you're the highest and. and they talked about it earlier this week that it's likely they've already found who their guy is. They're just not releasing who it is because they're trying to get through the second scrimmage. And as we've seen with the transfer portal, teams are going to hold on longer to release who the starter is because they don't want their depth to leave. They don't want guys to early in camp realize, okay, I'm not the guy I'm leaving because as soon as they sit in a classroom, they have to wait through the end of the semester to transfer. So, I think Tech's going to hold on until we get closer to game week, probably towards the end of next week. But I think it's going to be Tyler Shuck. And uh, Ole Miss, that's a, that's an interesting one as well with Jackson Dart coming in. And then um, Luke Altmeyer, who played in the Sugar Bowl against Baylor last year when he was pressed into duty, battling it out. Jackson Dart is interesting to me because at USC, he had a couple flashes where you were like, man, this guy may be the next Carson Palm. I mean, he looked the part – looks phenomenal, and then obviously transfers out. Luke Altmeyer did some nice things last year in relief for Matt Corral in the bowl game, did some nice things. Uh, this one, to me, really 50-50. I, I don't know enough about and haven't gotten any real read from anybody inside the walls at Ole Miss to give a, a lean either way. The more talented player here to me is Jackson Dart, but there hasn't been anything that says that he's come in and taken that job. And with Luke Altmaier being in that system last year, maybe you lean in that direction. Yeah. Uh, and Cincinnati is replacing Desmond Ritter, uh, you know, perhaps, and I don't want to get Cincinnati fans mad, but the, the greatest quarterback in their history. No, I don't think there's uh, I, I don't think if your quarterback leads you to the final four, it takes you to a place where everybody else in the country said you didn't belong. I don't think there's anything wrong with giving – uh, giving him the credit there for that. But they've got an interesting QB battle because Ben Bryant was with Cincinnati, realized he wasn't going to start, transferred to Eastern Michigan, took them to a bowl game. It's almost like he went to the minor league and is now back at Cincinnati. Behind him is Evan Prater, who was Mr. Ohio, four-star QB, one of the biggest recruits ever at Cincinnati. And I think that's the guy. I think Evan Prater, when you watch him on tape, he runs around a lot like Desmond Ritter, real tall, lean, athletic. And I think – there's your upside moving forward. But Ben Bryant played a lot of football and because he had last season under his belt that Evan Prater just doesn't have there. So if you're tracking the American this year, that's going to be a battle worth watching through the first couple of weeks. But in my mind, it's Evan Prater. Taylor McCarg, college football analyst with us here every Friday at 430. Taylor, enjoy the weekend. I'm sure we'll have, uh, you know, actual games to talk. We have actual games to talk about next week. It's zero week. Yeah, I preview some. Uh, we've got some Conference USA next week. Uh, we could talk about, you know, I love talking about the UTEP minors. We can kick around some of the big matchups. We can even talk about Vanderbilt, Hawaii, the nightcap. So finally have some football next week to preview. Absolutely. Taylor, thank you so much. We'll talk to you next week, buddy. All right. Sounds good, guys. Appreciate it.